Uh, the title of this morning's sermon is The Lord Knows How to Rescue and Punish. You know, I start off many sermons by saying this, but it's true. Christian life is hard. But one of the reasons why it can be so hard is because of this. There are people in this world, and actually even in the church today, who are false. People who are not righteous. People who are actually destructive to God's people. Peter talks about this in this letter to the church. It's ultimately Jesus, though, instructing us. Jesus wants us to know about this because he loves us. And so this morning, as we read this, as we think about this subject matter, let's take it seriously. Starting in verses 3, 1 to 3. Peter, he talks about these people, who they are, what they do. Let's go through that really quickly. So these false prophets, these false teachers back then, and we've got a version of those today, they will bring secretly, they will bring destructive heresies. They will say things that are wrong, heresy, things that are false, not true, or maybe half-truth, but then mixed with those truth, things that are wrong, all in all, they will not be biblical. So that's what heresies are. And these people will bring these heresies, and these heresies will destroy the church, destroy people. Or let me be more, clear, let me be more precise. They will attempt to destroy. The church cannot be destroyed, ultimately. But yet, these heresies are destructive, meaning that they will be damaging to people's faith and the way that they live. And on top of all of that, this will be done secretly. It will be done quietly, behind the scenes, maybe privately, one-on-one, -on -one, and it will be maybe done cleverly and in a way that you cannot see at first. It's like the game Mafia. You know, if you're decent at the game, you're not going to go around and say, yeah, I'm the Mafia then you're going to die <laughs> real fast. No one is out there saying, hey, I'm a false prophet, just letting you know in advance. That doesn't happen. It's done secretly. And so we need to know this because there are people that may seem like one thing, but they are really another thing. They may seem nice and good, but they're actually mean and bad. <laughs> and, the vice, and the opposite is strangely, ironically true sometimes as well. Sometimes the folks who you think are mean and bad, they're actually the good guys. It's just a matter of perception. These false teachers or prophets, they will often do a bait and switch. They might talk about gospel stuff, and so in the beginning you're like, oh yeah, that sounds right. They seem correct. But then they will throw in there something that is a little bit off, a little bit strange. A lot of times... This is a thing I've noticed a lot in sermons that I see on YouTube. They will sound good for like the first 40 minutes and then the last 10 or 20 minutes. The application part is really weird. It's like something that has nothing to do with the Bible, nothing to do with the text. Something else is going on. Bait and switch. All in all, these uh, false teachers or prophets, because it is secretive, because these are heresies that are meant to destroy, these are people who often have an agenda that is not biblical. There is a conspiracy going on behind the scenes. They have a vision. They have a plan. They have a strat. And it's not good. They will secretly bring destructive heresies. Peter goes on to say that these people will deny the master. That's obviously talking about Jesus. And what this simply means is they will often do this. They will minimize Jesus. They might mention Jesus a little bit here and there, but they won't really talk about him at all. If you listen carefully to everything that they say, not just the snippets, you will realize that they're not Christ-centered. There's something else centered. It could be, hey, let's build my church. That's the center. Or, hey, let's just be rich or let's be healthy. That's the center of everything. And they might use Jesus they may talk about Jesus, 
but Jesus isn't the main thing for them. That's how you can deny the master. So that's another thing that you can notice about these false teachers. Peter goes on to say that one, another mark of these people is this. In their greed, they will exploit people with false words. Notice the words here, greediness and exploitation. You know, a lot of times these false teachers and prophets, you see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament, you see it today. They're greedy for what? Money, straight up money. But other times, it's a little more subtle. Maybe it's not really money. Maybe it's power. Maybe it's fame. Maybe it's pleasure or something else. In their greed, they do these things. And here's the really heartbreaking part. They will exploit people. Now that's a SAT word that simply means they're going to use and abuse church members, Christians, and believers. Taking advantage of brothers and sisters in Christ to the point of even treating them badly, whipping them into work, doing things for the church, or fleecing them, swindling them. That is exploitation. So for example, with this greediness and exploitation stuff, it's like almost unreal, but it's true. There are televangelists out there who will say, donate money to the church. Why? So that I can buy a private jet. Why? So I can go around the world and tell people about Jesus. Okay. <laughs> but then there are more subtle examples of this, this greed and exploitation, because maybe it's not about money. Maybe it's for the sake of making our church great making our church awesome, which again, you're thinking, wait, shouldn't we be doing that, PA? Not exactly. It takes some training, it takes some experience to kind of figure out that, wait, there's a line. There's a big difference between, yeah, we want our church to be great and awesome in terms of being biblical and for Jesus versus we want our church to be great because it's about our church and we got to make our budgets meet <laughs> and we want to be famous, and we, we just want to be the best church out there because all these other churches are not like us. It's not good. Peter goes on to talk about how another mark is they're about sensuality or lust, or they are people who are blaspheme, blasphemous. Um, this is kind of obvious. I won't talk about this too much, but either they take part in sexual sin or they may not take part in it themselves, but they will minimize that sin when it comes to other people. Like maybe there'll be something going on and they'll be like, you know what? Sexual sin is okay. You know, God can forgive and don't worry about it. It's like a minimizing of the terribleness of that sin and that is what it means when they're about sensuality or lust. <laughs> Blasphemy, this could obviously mean like either they're saying terrible, wrong things about God. Like a simple example is, yeah, God is loving, and that's it. They're not going to talk about how God is just. They're going to minimize that. They're going to try to argue against that, and that is blasphemy because they're saying something wrong about God. But blasphem blasphemy can be extended into something very basic that you all understand. Irreverence. Irreverence towards God. Irreverence in front of other people. There are pastors and Christians out there that they will on stage or in front of other Christians just swear and profane and cut people down with really bad humor, being very disrespectful. That's a mark of false teachers and false prophets. And they're out there. I'm, I'm doing my best not to name names at all at this sermon. But there are churches, there are pastors, there are leaders out there that do this. It's really, it's very real, church. And while this is not in verses 1 to 3, P Peter mentions this in the other verses. Two more, one more mark of uh, false teachers and prophets is they despise authority. They're not really into the authority of God in their lives. They don't really pay attention to the authority of God in the word. 
that it rules them. They, are, they have this rebelliousness. They have this pridefulness thinking that they are above the law of God. They are not into the authority of God, but they're also often not into the authority of God through the accountability of other people. So whether they're their own church and there's no other churches that could speak into their lives, whether they're like the head leader, pastor of the church, and they're the boss, they're the dictator, everyone else is under him or her, then there's no accountability. That is a, that is a despising of authority. So that's, what, that's who these people are. That's what they do. It's pretty serious, right? And it's kind of scary, especially if it's being done in secret. Um, maybe some people or churches come to mind right now, and, and honestly, you might be thinking, yeah, how could these people fall for such things? How could these people say such things? But what Peter wants us to know is that, no, that's, that's not a wrong way to look at it. Um, these things happen. And we should not be proud in ourselves and thinking, oh, these people must be stupid. They must like be really primitive people. No. The point here is that the work of these false teachers and prophets, it's so strong, it's so good, it's so secretive that people are, are tricked. People are tricked. <laughs> you know, like for the longest time, I thought to myself, I'll, I'll never be tricked by like the fake uh, emails or the spam. But every once in a while, I do get tricked still. And it's like, oh my gosh, what the heck? I almost clicked that button. Thank goodness I didn't. Like the point here is that these false teachings um, can become very like sophisticated, secretive, like convincing. And Peter is saying it's there and watch out for it. Now, will they succeed? In one sense, yes, and in another sense, no. In one sense, yes, false teachers and prophets, they do succeed because, Peter says, many will follow them. Many will follow them. They will have crowds of people following them, believing in what they say. And that is a sense in which they will succeed. Quick side note, this is why, personally, I, I think it's a pretty decent red flag when a church is huge. I'm talking like mega church. Like, they need to have show, the burden of proof is on them to show that why they're that big. There's, there's something, there's a red flag to that. And I'm not saying that all mega churches are automatically bad, but I'm automatically going to be walking into that church looking out for red flags because this is a mark of false teaching. They're going to get the crowds. It's going to be popular. People are going to like it. It's going to feel culty. It's going to be like, yeah, this is right. No, the opposite should be true. Where Paul talks about how like we are to be like Bereans, like every church member should be checking their churches in a healthy way, um, listening carefully to whatever whoever whatever their pastor says and then making sure it's backed up by scripture. I don't like posting my sermons online, but why do I do it? It's not to be famous. It's so that I can be checked. I can be held accountable by anyone who listens to it. There's a record of what I said and what I teach here at Highland. And my presbytery, my friends, they can listen to it and they could correct me if I need to. You guys too as well. Many will follow them. They will succeed in a sense, but, and this is now the turning point of the sermon, they will not succeed at all. In a whole different sense, they will fail completely. Why? Because Peter says they will receive swift destruction and condemnation. And it's not going to come from us. It's not going to come from church members. It's not going to come from other pastors per se. The destruction is the Lord's. The condemnation comes from ultimately God, even as they get away with it. Now, you might be thinking, wait, how is it swift? 
Well, it comes down to how you define that word swift. Swift here does not mean that the destruction will happen right now. So let's say you see something today in 2023. Peter's not saying, oh, the destruction is going to come this year. That's not what swift means. What swift here means is that when the destruction happens, it will be fast, it will be furious, it will be huge, it will be like, it will be sudden in God's timing when Jesus comes back ultimately. When that destruction happens, it will be swift. And this is now the point of the sermon for us to take away. This is very encouraging. Why will these people fail? Because the Lord knows how to rescue and the Lord knows how to punish. If you remember anything from today's text, from this sermon, remember the title. The Lord knows how to rescue his people who are in danger of false prophets and teachers and stuff like that. And the Lord knows how to punish the false teachers and the prophets out there. And we see this in verse 9 and 10, 4 through 9, 4 through 10, sorry. Peter, he assures the church that God knows how to do this. He's in control. He's sovereign. This is not a surprise for him. God knows exactly how to rescue us, and God knows exactly how to bring punishment or more precisely, he keeps the unrighteous under punishment until judgment day. So that's interesting because right now, the unrighteous, the false teachers and prophets, they're running around, they're doing their things, they're scheming, they're plotting, and it seems like they're free. But what Peter's saying is, no, actually, God has boxed them in, and that box is getting smaller and smaller, like Loki style, and then they're going to be crushed one day. They are already under punishment. It just doesn't feel like it right now because it's delayed, because history is passing by, because God is giving them a chance to repent and believe in Jesus, because Jesus hasn't come back yet. But just because Jesus hasn't come back yet doesn't mean that the punishment is on. Oh, it's on. It's on right now. God is keeping them right now locked up. He's saving them for his judgment. And that is the punishment right now. But notice what Peter goes through. He goes through Old Testament stories. And his logic is simply this. Church, if God knew what to do, if God did what he did in history, then God knows what to do with us today. That's it. And so what does he talk about in the Old Testament? A few really important events. Actually, let's just say three. Number one is a really fascinating event. We don't read about this a lot in Scripture, but this is the one rare moment in the Bible where we are given insight into what happened before creation. The origin of Satan and the fallen angels. Peter says that God did not spare angels when they sinned. This is past tense. God made angels... God made humans, but God made angels. They are created beings, and some of them sinned against God, and they fell. And one of those was Satan. And God did not spare them. He cast them into hell. They are there right now in hell, locked up and in a box, being prepared for judgment day for Jesus when he comes back. So that happened. That's the first thing in history that happened. Peter is saying, look at that. If God knows how to do that, then guess what? God knows how to deal with false teachers and prophets. The second and third thing he points out is, is very famous stories that you all should know. Remember the flood? Remember Noah? The flood is a really, really profound thing in Scripture that you all need to think about today. If God flooded the earth and killed all the human beings then God knows how to deal with sin and wickedness and false teachers. And remember the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where fire and brimstone came down upon those cities and destroyed them all. Lot's wife turned around and 
she was destroyed with the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. If God did that, then God knows how to punish the wicked. But also, in those stories, you notice that Noah and Lot were saved. They were rescued. Literally, Noah was rescued by the ark, and Lot was told what was going to happen, and God and the angels said to them, flee, run away, and he did, and he escaped that judgment. So th that means what Peter is saying is simple. God knows how to rescue his people. He did it before, and he'll do it again. Past performance is an indicative of future results when it comes to God. But I do got to mention the gospel of Jesus Christ here because if you notice, Peter talks about Lot and Noah in a really good way. He calls Noah a herald of righteousness, and that is true. And he calls Lot a righteous man who was distressed. He was tormented by the sin of the world around him. That is true as well. But what's interesting is if you know the stories of Noah and Lot, you'll know that they were pretty messed up people. They did a lot of questionable things. They were sinners. They were sinners who needed Jesus, just like you and me. And yet, they're called righteous here. Why? It's not because of who they are. It's not because of what they did. Noah, even though his life was messed up, Lot, even though he did wrong things, they believed in what was true. They put their hope in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who would save them from their sins. And he did save them from their sins. And so they are called righteous now. Praise the Lord. And God rescued them. He rescued them with his grace. But again, the main point here is simply this. If God did those things in the Old Testament, God will do these things at the end. When Jesus comes back, he will know how to rescue us. He will know how to punish the wicked. And he's, he will do it in the future, and he is doing it right now in ways that we cannot understand. Praise be to our God that he rescues us from trials, from persecutions, from sufferings. That doesn't mean that he will completely take us out of that, like keep us in a bubble as if these things will never happen. No, instead he will get us through the trials. Through the sufferings, God is able to rescue us. And so praise the Lord. Because we can think that there's no hope when there's times of struggle, especially when it comes to false teachers. Maybe less for you, but more for me because I'm a pastor. I'm sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, God, why are there false teachers out there in 2023? And when we, people can worry we can worry about these false teachers. We can worry, is our church going to be okay? And we are heartbroken when we see other Christians who are hurt by false teachers and who suffer. But the good news is that Jesus knows how to rescue his church. While the heresies are meant to be destructive and there is a sense in which they do destruct, at the end of the day, they cannot truly, fully destroy the elect, God's people, the church. And so thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for how you rescue us. And also thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, that the bad guys will lose at the end. That the false teachers, they may get away with their things right now, but God knows how to catch them. In fact, God has already caught them. And God knows how to finish them. God wins. God doesn't lose. The church will be okay at the end. And we need to hear that too. And also, the bad guys need to hear this too. They think that they're okay. They think that there are no consequences for what they do. Maybe they think God is slow to anger, slow to judge. They may ask, 
Jesus hasn't come back for 2,000-something years. I guess this isn't real. That's what they'll say. Or they'll say, oh, but God is such a forgiving God. Let's take advantage of that. And they abuse God's grace and God's forgiveness. But what they need to know is that actually God knows exactly who they are and what they do. And God knows what he's going to do with them. Our God is powerful. Our God is sovereign. And so, in closing, let us praise our God for this simple fact, that he knows how to rescue us and that he knows how to punish the false, belief, false teachers and prophets. God is rescuing us, rescuing us, in a sense, right now through the means of grace, through word, and through the Lord's Supper. This is a rescue. This is God cleaning us and God loving us and protecting us. Every Sunday, as we pray together, as we fellowship together, this is rescue day. And so praise be to our God for this day. Praise be to our God for this church and pray for this church. Pray for me. Pray for Pastor Jason. Um, we want to say in good conscience that we're not false teachers, but we, we might make mistakes here and there, and there may be false teachings here and there. So while there is a black and white thing going on, false teachers versus the rest of us, we ought to be careful that we do not fall into false teaching in general. There's a gray area. And even if we're not false teachers ourselves, if we've succumbed to false teaching, if we hear it and if we use it, if we believe in it and it plays out in our lives, it can bring damage. You know, you may not make counterfeit money. But if counterfeit money comes to you and then you actually use it, I looked this up, this is fascinating, you will be arrested. Even if you didn't make the counterfeit money, but if it goes through you, if you use it, they will come down on you and then you will have to explain things. You can get out of it, but you will be arrested, that's for sure. And so in the same way, you may not be a false teacher. You may not be one of them, but be careful. Pray for our church. Pray for me. Be, have discernment in what you're listening to, who you're looking at, all the things out there in this world. You may not know it, but you may start believing in things that are not right, and that's counterfeit money. Be careful. Don't be surprised by false teaching when you hear about it. Don't be surprised by um, news stories of men or women who fall from grace because they are found out to be wrong or false. And lastly, probably most importantly, be comforted. This is a scary world that we live in, and within the church, there can be false teachers and prophets. But we have the comfort knowing that God knows everything, that God knows what to do with us, and with them, and that we are safe in Jesus' hands. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much that you are our God who knows how to rescue and who knows how to punish. Lord, may your Holy Spirit um, help us to take seriously your word today, to apply it correctly in our lives. Help us to be aware, vigilant against false teaching and help our church and help our presbytery, help our denomination and our friends and families out there who believe in you, Jesus, and especially our friends and family out there who are uh, in danger of false teachers around them. Lord, there can be destruction, but you know how to rescue us. And so may you rescue us and may you punish them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.